right, it's five o'clock, so I think we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, I just want to welcome everyone to our webinar, How to Heal a Forest, uh, talking with part of our Conservation Northwest Forest Field Team about forest and watershed health and resilience on the national forest lands. I'm Jen, I'm the membership associate and your moderator for the evening. Uh, before we get started, just a quick reminder for those of us still getting used to the Zoom webinar format. During the webinar, uh, you'll be able to hear and see us, but we will not be able to hear or see you. But don't worry, if you have any burning questions about national forests and restoration, you can go ahead and submit those to the question and answer button at the bottom of your screen. We have someone standing by to answer some of those questions right there in the box. And uh, some of them will also be answered by our panelists at the end of the talk during our question and answer session. Uh, this event will, is being recorded and will be shared again at a later date. So if you have to step away or miss any part of it, you can catch up with that later. If you're having some connection issues, we have a phone number you can call in for technical support, or you can actually call into the webinar. That is now in the chat if you need that. And we're going to start off with our panel discussion, which will be about 35 minutes. We'll reserve the remainder of the hour to answer your questions related to Washington National Forests. And we'll plan to wrap up right at six so you can enjoy the rest of your lovely sunny evening we're having in Seattle. Uh, so with that, I want to turn it over to our Science and Conservation Director, Dave Wurntz. Uh, Dave works out of our TWISP field office. He is a forest ecologist, long been involved in Pacific Northwest conservation efforts, and from what I understand is an expert uh, at calling a spotted owl. So take it away, Dave. Thanks a lot, Jen, and thanks to everyone for joining us today. Conservation Northwest works to protect, connect, and restore wildlife and habitat across the Pacific Northwest, including in the North and Central Cascades of Washington, the hub of our regional conservation efforts. In this context, protect means defending our public lands and its rich biological diversity from harmful development and restoring degraded areas uh, to improve habitat and ecological resilience to climate change. Connect means resolving barriers to wildlife movement between these core habitat areas, allowing safe passage over and under highways, for example, using crossing structures that you might see on I-90 uh, and in other places across the strait and in British Columbia. Improving habitat connectivity helps wildlife adapt to climate change. Restore means repopulating this interconnected network of wildlands with species that were once widespread, but have become rare and endangered, like the wolf, the fisher, the wolverine. And restoring wildlife populations revives their ecological role and function, leaving a better world for our children and our nation. Protect, connect, and restore, that's the Conservation Northwest mission. The forest field team the subject of today's gathering focuses on protecting those large contiguous tracts of public forest and wildlands, that vibrant core habitat that is essential to the survival and in some cases the recovery of our region's fish and wildlife populations. <clears throat> to share more about the Forest Field Program, I'm joined today by two <laughs> colleagues, Mike Liu and Dr. Kathleen Gobosh. Mike is our lead staff person on the Okanagan on the east slopes of the Cascades. Mike joined our team in February after a long and distinguished career in the Forest Service, most recently as district ranger in the Metau Valley where he worked with the community and coordinated with Conservation Northwest to complete a number of important restoration projects. As ranger, Mike had a vital role in protecting 350,000 acres in the Metau headwaters from a huge open pit copper mine. Kathleen, is our lead staff person on the Mount Baker Snoqualmie National Forest in the West Cascades and the Wenatchee National Forest on the east side, just south of Okanagan. And she is the manager for our Central Cascades Watershed Restoration Program, spanning both of these national forests. <laughs> Kathleen joined the team in November after working around the world on habitat and wildlife conservation for a number of public and private agencies, developing conservation strategy, 
science and the teams and coalitions and partnerships that help deliver conservation on the ground. Really great to have you both here today. If you know us, you'll know that there are three principal themes that shape how the forest field team and even Conservation Northwest operates. Number one is scientific fidelity. We aim to bring the science from the halls of academia, the peer reviewed journals, even agency reports into the field where important wildlife decisions are being made as it is the most reliable for informed decision-making, weighing uh, risks and trade-offs, but also ensuring quality outcomes for wildlife and habitat. Science is our guide, applied in the service of conservation. Secondly, the landscape scale. We look at the big picture, partly because this is the scale at which prominent natural disturbances operate in the Pacific Northwest. That includes things like fire and flooding, both expected to get worse on our warming planet. It's also the scale for meaningful recovery actions for our region's wide ranging species. Because providing habitat for things like spotted owls and grizzly bears ensures there's quality habitat for hundreds, even thousands of other species. And then third, community. We work with practical and pragmatic people, the scientists, the technicians, the foresters, the managers, and others in coalition to process ideas, work through challenges, identify the really what is the best way to advance forest and watershed restoration. Working together in this way allows for really durable outcomes and broad public support. So, this approach using science, working at the landscape scale, and working within the community has resulted in protection for thousands of acres of old growth forests and other forest habitat, improved ecological conditions for wildlife across the region, and benefits to many communities around the Cascades. So now I want to turn it over to Kathleen and Mike to share more about the important issues and projects that they're involved in. Kathleen? Okay, um, thanks Dave and thanks everyone for attending this talk. Um, we're excited that you're interested in learning more about our forests, where we are now and where we need to go. So we all know what legacy effects or legacy impacts are, right? Um, these are ongoing consequences, the legacy of large scale man-made disturbances from the past. Um, so the man-made disturbances in the past on our forests are primarily intensive timber harvest from the 1950s through to the early 1990s. And then the dense road network that was created uh, around these harvests to support them. So our forests and the landscapes I lead on, they're not what they should be. They're suffering from legacy impacts. And this is why restoration is needed. And it's to improve the ecological integrity and resilience of our forests. And we've known this for a long time. The 1994 Northwest Forest Plan spells this out for us. But what's new and what's happened since 94 is a lot of great science telling us about climate change and that we need to prepare our landscapes for a changed climate if we're going to preserve them. And this is to preserve their uh, important ecological services. So what do I mean by that? So ecological and services uh, include clean air, clean water, habitat for salmon, for uh, northern spotted owls, for small and large carnivores and their prey, but also means ecological services um, for you and me in terms of emotional, spiritual, physical space that us Pacific Northwesterners need to thrive. So I'm gonna walk you through our work on a few landscapes that I focus on to better illustrate how we go about healing our forests. So, um, just as uh, Dave introduced our goals and objectives for our forest field program, let me give you a little bit more detail. So first and foremost, um, the way we heal a forest is, well, we don't do it alone. Uh, we work to increase the pace and scale of forest restoration with partners and in collaborative groups. This includes other environmental NGOs, um, watching out for wildlife and habitat in our state, state agencies like DNR and WDFW, um, Federal agencies that are mandated to recover endangered species like NOAA and Fish and Wildlife Service, the tribes, um, really important stakeholder 
Um, we work with them on specific landscapes, but they also have a vested interest in the health of our salmon across the board and in first foods like elk and huckleberries. And then of course we work with the US uh, Forest Service, probably work with them the most. They're biologists, ecologists, hydrologists, any of their ologists you can think of. Um, they're roads engineers, they're rangers, and they're supervisors. And then we work with scientists, um, just like Dave explained. Many of us are trained scientists like myself and others on staff here. Um, and then we contract scientists, we work with the, the federal scientists, and then we constantly study the emerging science. Um, and the, one reason why is these are dynamic landscapes. They're in constant flux and change. And this is natural, we expect this. And then we also have these indirect effects from uh, man-made uh, uh, issues like climate change and uncharacteristic wildfire. I'm not going to go into that one. I'm going to let uh, Mike walk you through some of that. <laughs> um, but suffice it to say, these uh, landscapes are changing constantly and we need to stay up on the science. Um, so, um, so also we need to, as Dave said, talk about scale. What scale are we talking about? Well, at Conservation Northwest, we advocate for forest restoration at ecologically meaningful scales. So in terms of the forests where I work, that means the upper watersheds. And we wanna have a holistic, comprehensive view of these snow-fed water drainages and how they interact with the vegetation and the trees um, and the wildlife to develop the best restoration plans. Um, and so that involves looking at uh, the quality of the water and the temperature, but also the tree stands, how dense they are, how natural they are. So for example, in Mount Baker Snoqualmie National Forest, I'm concentrating on two landscapes, the Snoquera and the Nooksack. Um, the Snoquera uh, consists of the Upper White River and the Upper Green River watersheds. So they say what happens in the upper watersheds and the headwaters happens throughout. So these are our watersheds here in uh, Seattle and, and the feeding uh, Tacoma. Um, so they're important. Um, and then also the Nooksack, it's up in uh, Mount Baker to Bellingham area, that watershed. And it also um, feeds into Puget Sound. So all of these, these three watersheds are immensely important for us, for salmon, and for our beloved orca. Um, so why, why these two watersheds, you might ask? Well, a couple years back, um, Conservation Northwest pulled together a team of experts to do a west side forest strategy um, workshop to try to see, you know, where can we um, get the most, I guess, bang for, for our buck in terms of restoration. So with the experts, we did a fairly sophisticated modeling exercise to prioritize, um, you know, we took a step back and looked at the whole forest did the modeling exercise just to prioritize what areas needed the most recovery um, and, and that also had a, a high recovery potential. So we knew if we went in there, we'd get a lot back in terms of restoration. And these two rose to the top. So that's why we're working there. Um, also in terms of Snoquera, this is a, a part of that critical linkage between the North and South Cascades. So it's a natural extension of our, our decades old hard work that CNA, CNW has been in in the I-90 corridor that I'm sure many of you are familiar with. And from that, we built 11 uh, wildlife cro crossings across that um, high elevation critical linkage um, that so many mammals and other wildlife need, those wide ranging mammals that need to move across the landscape. So key to this process is landscape evaluations is key to the prioritization, but also into the plans that we start to pinpoint what actions we need to do. So those uh, tools, these evaluations, use LIDAR and other images to characterize the forest, the vegetation, on how it was historically in a more natural state, how it is now, and then they forecast what is likely to be under climate scenarios going forward. So we look across this whole continuum to try to determine what do we need to do today to get us ready for a climate change future. So it's with the Northwest Forest Plan, um, our prioritization exercises and uh, tools like landscape evaluations that we work with our partners to develop an action plan. Um, so, uh, and incidentally on the east side, they have something similar. It's a 20 year restoration strategy for east side forests. Um, 
and uh, the, the state of Washington was, DNR was really involved in creating that and, and all the other partners. And that is a similar prior, prioritization exercise for that side of the crest. Um, so in the Snow Quero landscape, um, we were able to create a holistic, comprehensive landscape scale project um, to restore that, those forests to health. And it was successfully planned over several years um, in, and this was according to the National Environmental Policy Act, NEPA process. And there's key uh, phases in that process where um, Conservation Northwest and other public uh, individuals can, can give public opinion. So we were there every step of the way, voicing our members, your concerns, and the needs of wildlife to make sure that improving ecological integrity and forest health was at the forefront of all the decisions made. So once we got through that to an approved decision, then it's time to act. And that's where the real fun uh, happens. We can get out on the ground and start taking the steps to restore. And some of the things coming out of the Snow Quero project included, uh, include um, thinning, dense monoculture uniform, um, stands of trees. They're a legacy, a legacy effect of past clear cuts and replanting that wasn't planted to create a healthy forest, but more of a, a future harvest. Well, we're, we've walked away from a lot of that and we want to restore these forests. So uh, now we do have to remove some trees to make more, make room so individual trees can get bigger and we can have those big old trees like you'd see um, in late successional forests. So we need to accelerate those dense kind of toothpick looking forests to a healthy condition. We also use prescribed fire to thin out, uh, to reduce fuel loads after thinning has occurred. Um, and then, um, you know, especially on the east side, fire suppression, uh, decades of that means that there's some high fuel loads out there that need to be taken care of. And another issue that's really important to Conservation Net, uh, Northwest is the dense road network. Um, this is really troublesome for wildlife and fish, especially because sediment erodes into the streams and creeks and clogs, clogs those. So we need to take care of reducing those dense road networks. Um, in some, uh, by some uh, scientific uh, analyses say that we should have uh, not more than one mile per uh, square mile, one mile of road per square mile of a forest. It's as high as six miles in some places. So there's a lot of work to be done there. And then lastly, another action that we focus on is aquatic conservation. The Northwest Forest Plan spells out nine essential elements that have to be incorporated. They relate to uh, returning our streams, stream banks, riparian areas back to health so they can function well. So the Snow Quero project is a great model um, for what we like to see and we're excited to get on the ground. We've actually been on the ground the last couple uh, summers, maybe with some of you. And um, we're gonna be out there again this summer. Unfortunately, um, our volunteering is a little bit tough in this COVID reality, um, but it's a model project. And um, this summer we're focused on moving dispersed campsites away from uh, riparian and, and waterways, fish bearing streams to give those fish a fighting chance and, and restore those places. Um, in, in contrast to Snoqualmie, the other landscape we're working on in, in, in the Mount Baker Snoqualmie is the Nooksack. Um, beautiful place. I'm sure many of you have been hiking up there by uh, Mount Baker. Um, and that project started off on the right foot, um, the same kind of holistic integrative restoration project at a landscape scale. And we appreciated that for sure and were involved. Um, it took a funny turn in the last couple months. Um, it was kind of in a pre-scoping phase. We thought it was gonna move to the next phase and instead it got canceled. So that was curious. And then recently popped up a kind of small project um, piecemeal looking just at the vegetation and including timber harvests and even clear cuts kind of at a, a scale that we haven't seen in quite a while, almost 2000 acres. So you'll be getting an, um, an alert, an action alert tomorrow from us on that. We'd like you to send your comments in. We've worked hard, uh, Dave and I, for, it seems like forever, but I guess it's really only been a few days or like a week on our comments uh, to try to get the Forest Service to go back to where 
they were, you know, their original approach, a holistic, integrative approach of looking at the whole watershed and what's needed um, uh, to restore the habitat um, and forest to health. So um, I think I'll end there. I could probably go on for a while, but I think it's Mike's turn. <clears throat> well, hi. Boy, are you able to see me? <laughs> yeah. Okay. <clears throat> my uh, screen isn't showing. Anyhow, uh, my name's Mike, and uh, wow, David and Kathleen have covered a lot of ground already. You know, when uh, I was asked to participate on this panel for the webinar, I kept asking myself, uh, how do we heal a forest, really? And uh, as Dave and Kathleen both have said, you have to start at the right scale. And I think we all know when we go see a doctor, uh, maybe for something like a headache, they'll look at the whole body, right? Because what's uh, causing our headache might not be something in the head, but in our gut or wherever else. And so you have to have that larger landscape perspective. And that's uh, the scale that we like to start at with um, the Forest Field a program. That's what we encourage our partners and the agencies to look at. And then from there, we can then do the diagnosis and really hone in on how do we or what elements of the forest um, need healing. Not everything is um, necessarily parted or in need of uh, restoration. So we try to focus our efforts on those areas that really require or need our attention uh, so that we're effective and uh, efficient in what we do. And once we uh, kind of hone in, you know, Kathleen talked about the upper watershed. Generally, you know, we're talking about 20 to 40,000 acres in size, uh, these watersheds that we uh, like to start at in terms of the landscape scale. <clears throat> and then we also have to know what healthy forests uh, look like. What are we trying to bring these forests back to or um, into the future with? And that's where uh, a lot of work has gone in. Uh, I think you saw in the earlier slides a picture of a 1930 panoramic from a Osborne fire um, panorama and a more recent photo showing uh, a lot of growth in. <clears throat> and so a healthy forest really looks different between um, the west side and those forests in areas that Kathleen works in and the east side here in the Cascades where I live and work. Uh, for one thing, we get a whole lot less rain and a whole lot more sunshine. So in the rain shadow of the Cascade, that means our forests are gonna be, generally the trees are shorter, the sands are more open, and the dominant trees are more fire adapted. And so knowing what kind of forest, what kind of patient you have, if you will, helps you uh, understand what a healthy forest for that ecological region really should look like. Uh, for myself, you know, I spend time uh, in the wilderness areas, in areas that are um, maybe not devoid, but have minimal human activity to get a sense of what a, a natural force might feel like, uh, absent human intervention. Um, we uh, use historic photos a lot to see what the landscapes looked like in the past. Uh, we use a lot of aerial photo imagery, Google Earth now that that's available, uh, old maps, and look for those landscape patterns uh, that we can uh, copy or mimic. And we read a lot of peer-reviewed research, um, articles on dendrochronology, uh, look at evidence of past fire scars to know what those fire return intervals were. <clears throat> and all of those give us really a, a better picture of what a healthy forest should look like and what were the processes that um, really took place on the landscape that perpetuated the wildlife species, the, the fish, the plants that currently exist on that landscape, <clears throat> you know, before um, the roads and the cattle grazing, mining, timber harvesting, all those legacy um, effects there that Kathleen talked about earlier. So, you know, all together, once we, kind of figure out what a healthy forest looks like, um, then we can compare it with our current conditions. And Kathleen alluded a little bit to some of the um, evaluation tools that we have. Here on the east side, on the Okanagan Wenatchee National Forest, we're pretty lucky because the Forest Service ha actually has one of their forest sciences lab 
right in Wenatchee, right next to or close to the Ford Supervisor's Office. And so as a result, that created an environment where scientists and land managers were able to really look at the current research, uh, what technology was available, and they've developed uh, what's called the restoration strategy for the forest, uh, which really uh, also incorporates the use of a computer model. Um, it's called Ecosystem Management Decision Support, or EMDS. Um, <clears throat> that's not really important, but the, the model itself really helps evaluate uh, the current conditions of the forest with historic, uh, known historic conditions and comes up with really this, the, what we call a departure. Um, how different is this particular stand uh, condition from historic or past conditions? <clears throat> and that same model can then project in a warmer, drier uh, scenario uh, what would the forest look like? And there's a sweet spot where the historic range of variability and what we might expect as a future range of variability um, match up. And that's kind of a, a sweet spot that really managing our forests both um, to be resilient to climate change and uh, the future, as well as <clears throat> really looking at what kind of structure and processes occurred in the past. Uh, is a, a great place to, to aim for in healing of our forests. So um, with those products as an organization and with partners, uh, like Kathleen said, it we don't operate independently. Uh, we like the IRS, I guess. Uh, we like to work in partnerships with uh, others, with uh, the agencies that really are charged to manage these lands. And so uh, we, for instance, through the North Central Washington Forest Health Collaborative, really worked with uh, the Okanagan Wenatchee to utilize the restoration strategy in the Upper Wenatchee project area, for instance. That's an area that Kathleen, or a project that Kathleen's uh, monitoring and uh, participating in. Uh, we also here in the Okanagan uh, have really supported and pushed for the use of that uh, larger restoration strategy on places like Mount Hall uh, over in Tenasket uh, for the Mission Project area and also for the current uh, Twist River analysis. So um, by encouraging uh, through partnerships, through the collaborative, the use of um, the latest scientific tools and modeling, uh, we feel like we can help influence the decisions towards better outcomes. And um, when those results um, start coming out, we try to then focus the agencies on those areas that uh, we feel uh, really need some help, uh, for whether we call that healing or re restoring or building resilience. You know, things like old growth and large old trees, uh, the scientific information or data out there um, confirms what we already know intuitively, and that's our landscapes of today have far fewer large old trees than ever that existed 50 or 100 years ago. <clears throat> and so they're uh, becoming more and more scarce, and uh, there's ramifications as uh, old growth dependent species see um, these large old trees and forests decline. And so we encourage treatments that protect old growth and leave the old large trees. Uh, we look at stands where thinning can help the trees that are left grow bigger faster uh, and stay healthier so that they can become that future old growth. Um, <clears throat> Kathleen did a great job talking uh, about the roads, but uh, another example on the South Summit project here in the uh, Okanagan County uh, was uh, some road decommissioning that was identified through uh, a NEPA process or an, an environmental analysis process <clears throat> where funding was insufficient to decommission those roads. And Conservation Northwest, through um, working with partners and um, others, found funding to help the Forest Service. And we were able to get into a challenge cost share agreement actually with the Okanagan National Forest to decommission those roads. So, uh, we're not just about encouraging the forest to um, maybe do the right thing, but also uh, when they can't because they don't have the capacity or the funds, 
uh, we try to find that for them. Uh, another example, for instance, is uh, an area during the analysis process and before implementation can occur is historic uh, archaeological surveys need to be done to make sure sites aren't disturbed. Um, and uh, currently the force has very few archaeologists working. And so another area that uh, Conservation Northwest, the forest field team is working on is uh, working with the Colville tribe who um, have quite a few archaeologists and have a keen interest in management here, particularly in the Manhattan Valley and Tenasket, your uh, historic tribal um, hunting and gathering grounds, uh, seeded lands, and um, trying to get their archaeologists to be able to do some of those surveys, which enrich their understanding of their history, uh, provides opportunities for the forest to um, increase the pace and scale of restoration on the ground as well. <clears throat> so those are ways that um, as an organization, we also try to make those connections. Um, we, I guess uh, I should talk about uncharacteristically intense uh, wildfires that we've seen. You know, I've lived through here in the, well, I guess over a decade now, but we've seen the two largest uh, wildfires in Washington state history um, here in the Okanagan. And that's uh, uncharacteristically larger and more intense than we would expect historically. And that's because uh, a lot of our drier forests over here have become choked with small trees due to the absence of periodic um, ground fires. And <clears throat> when you look at the success rate of uh, initial attack on the Okanagan Wenatchee National Forest, you know, the Forest Service knows how to put out fires. They, they catch about 97% of the uh, wildfires that start. Um, only uh, two to three percent get large. <clears throat> and those are the ones we read about. But all those little ones that um, were put out didn't have the opportunity to clear the surface fields or kill some of the smaller trees that were encroaching um, in on the larger trees and um, raise crown heights, for instance. And so as a result now here on the east side, we have a lot of dense forests and uh, thinning is a, a major concern. Conservation Northwest has supported and helped with uh, the Lost Driveway Project, for instance, that reduced those hazardous fuels and moved those stands back towards a more uh, natural condition, uh, providing some of those processes. Um, just on a time check, if I'm, am I needing to stop? <laughs> I think, I think so. so. so yeah, I think I if you could wrap up, Mike, yeah, that'd be, that'd be yeah. helpful. So yeah, uh, we're engaged with a lot of the prescribed burning discussions here in the east side, particularly as they center around House Bill uh, 1784. We're um, certainly uh, also engaged in a lot of the range uh, concerns uh, with riparian corridors. And for the uh, sake of time, I'll just wrap up by saying that uh, we're working hard in these communities to be a, a voice for the healing of our forest, um, trying to stay engaged in forest management projects from conception to completion uh, so that we really can learn uh, from those results and improve how we uh, continue to engage in helping to heal our public lands, uh, the forest that we enjoy. All right, back to you. Great, thanks a lot, Mike and Kathleen. And um, so now that you've heard a bunch about uh, some of our work on the ground, um, uh, there's also a lot of action in the other Washington that I wanna to speak to, and then we'll wrap up and turn to questions from you all. So in the other Washington, uh, while we've been busy, you know, working to repair those old wounds and improve ecological resilience on our public lands. The Trump administration has been simultaneously dismantling even the most sensible environmental laws and policies that protect our natural, natural heritage. And these laws and policies require scientifically informed, rational decision-making, for example. They allow communities and residents input on projects that affect them. Uh, 
I want to highlight a couple examples for you. Just over a year ago, the Trump administration announced major changes to the Endangered Species Act, which protects our most vulnerable wildlife facing extinction threats. In just last January, the administration announced changes to the National Environmental Policy Act, we've heard a little bit about today, that would eliminate that public review and environmental review for many federal projects. It is through that NEPA process that project ideas are processed and refined and improved by public feedback and scientific review, resulting in better outcomes for wildlife, national forests, and for people living nearby. Just a few days ago, President Trump issued an executive order invoking an emergency section of federal law allowing significant harm to wildlife and habitat without the normal Endangered Species Act or environmental, National Environmental Policy Act requirements. The, the order essentially waives environmental laws in order to speed up the approval of federal projects like timber sales. But it's not all bad news. Congress has also been real busy. And just last week, the US Senate passed the Great American Outdoors Act, which permanently authorizes the Land and Water Conservation Fund, which supports land purchases and recreation development. It also allocates billions, billions to address decades old maintenance backlog on federal lands and provides resources for habitat restoration and habitat connectivity on federal lands in the Pacific Northwest. If you have questions about those things or, or other things that you've heard about today, you can find more details on our website. We'll continue to push back and even block some of these terrible ideas and support and advocate for policies that make things better for fish and wildlife in the Pacific Northwest. So thank you for, for being with us tonight and I return back to you, Jen. Well, thanks panelists. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and roll into some questions. Thank you to everyone who submitted them throughout the talk and also a few we got in ahead of time. So our first question is from um, one of our attendees right now. Uh, what do your partners at US Fish and Wildlife Sur or the US Forest Service need from CNW and others to move forward a toward a more ecologically and climate adapted stewardship? I can take a first jump at that and then Kathleen and Mike if you want to add in I just give you an example that um, one of the things that we helped with the Forest Service in developing the restoration projects is um, to provide support for landscape analysis and to provide some of that technical input to help make sure that those analyses are efficient and effective um, so that's one way that we've helped contribute. There's also, um, we work a lot with the, with the local collaboratives and uh, in the North Central Washington Collaborative was instrumental in helping the agency do some pre-field surveys to get a, just a handle on what's going on on the ground in places where, um, you know, their resources may be somewhat limited. Those are just a couple of examples where uh, we've been able to cooperate and coordinate with the Forest Service in order to help uh, projects uh, develop and, and move forward. I'll add, it kind of builds on what Dave said. Um, so like in Snoqueera, there's a really uh, great biologist there with the Forest Service, but um, you know, they're just strapped uh, by resources and just not enough capacity. So um, the biologist's name is Dave Kendrick. <laughs> I doubt that he's on this, but maybe he is. But we just realized, man, if there were two Dave Kendricks, wouldn't that be great? And so um, one of the projects we have going is just to kind of uh, contract someone to be a second Dave Kendrick and help him so more can get done faster. Because you also have a limit on the time when you can get out in the field, you know, because snow comes in or other issues. Um, so, you know, um, just getting a, a second Dave in that situation is what, what we're there for. Um, also, in the little uh, crow in the little Natchez watershed on the east side of the Central Cascades, there's a long list of restoration activities, and that project is going to um, has some retained receipts from um, uh, a timber um, a thinning exercise. And luckily, that those funds are going back towards restoration activities, and they're going to hit a lot of those, which is fantastic. 
But there are there was one that we saw on the list that the Forest Service was looking for nonprofit, you know, NGO partners to help with, and that re relates to restoring the meadows for the elk population there. It's a struggling elk population. Um, and so that's something we're looking into um, for, for like next season, like next year. Um, they, they identified the need. It's not, uh, it, it's kind of the right size of something that we could take on and help out with. So that's just two examples that come to mind. Do you have anything to add, Mike? Uh, thank you. Uh, this is a question from Gabrielle. When determining what sections of the forest are most important to focus time, energy, and money on restoring, what specific characteristics of potential areas are considered? That's a good question. Thanks, Gabrielle. Um, the, the, the main issue is, as I think Mike laid out, is have the stand conditions departed from historic or reference conditions? And that can happen in a couple different ways. It can happen through previous uh, logging activities. So basically going into a big patch of forest and putting in you know, a clear cut in the past that was done. And that, that changes the structure and composition uh, and function of the ecosystem in that area. So if it's, that, that may be one place that pops up that, that uh, is identified as uh, departed from the conditions that you might expect to find on that landscape. Another one uh, is as a result of fire suppression and other types of logging, not clear cutting, but high grade logging where they just go in and take the, the biggest and most valuable trees. That was very common you know, up through the 70s and 80s. Um, those are gonna be places that uh, the composition, that, that which species you would typically find, and the size and number uh, has been altered. So those usually will pop up also through the departure analysis and highlight uh, where some additional, where some focus restoration could help restore the conditions that support wildlife and ecosystem processes. I can add too that, you know, a lot of these restoration projects are long in duration. They're, they're, they're uh, assembled to be five to 10 year projects overall. And there's a sequencing, a natural or um, uh, maybe a reasonable or rational sequencing to projects. So like Dave said, when you find stands that you need to thin, you know, you're not going to do your road decommissioning until you've gotten those earlier things accomplished where you might want to use those roads to get them done. And then you do the decommissioning and you might not want to do some of the stream and water work until other things are done that could mess up what you just, you know, fix. So there's a natural sequence or a, a rational sequence there. Um, I know another one is like these fish barriers and the culverts. Um, blocking salmon movement. You know, there's other um, groups and laws and mandates that are requiring that to be expedited, uh, right? So then that will influence the, the timing. But that's all the more reason to have this holistic kind of vision or view of the watershed because you got to put these pieces together. And, um, you know, you look any one summer and it might not quite make sense why they're doing that that summer, but when you look at it, everything they got to do over the 10 year project, it kind of, the pieces fall together. Yeah, here on the east side, there's also some coordination uh, between Department of Natural Resources and the Forest Service as well. Kathleen talked about the 20 year um, plan that DNR developed and that was really a compromise really between the forest and DNR to look at where on the landscape do both agencies uh, maybe have plans to manage and we're by collectively treating those watersheds together, we can really increase the landscape impact uh, rather than just uh, each agency doing their own thing. And so there's a, a lot of variables that go into selection of where we um, invest time and money. All right. Um... Let me see, there's one more. Um, we have here from 
Carly. Actually, uh, Dave, could you update us on the NW, the Northwest Forest Plan and how we are advocating for that? Yeah, certainly. Great question. Um, so the Northwest Forest Plan is a regional ecosystem management and conservation plan that covers forests in the range of the northern spotted owl from northern California all the way up through Oregon and Washington to the border with British Columbia. And it is, uh, was a first initiated in 1994. And honestly, a lot has changed since then. And the forest is, uh, the uh, uh, Forest Service is considering uh, updating the Northwest Forest Plan. And so that's where we've been really engaging. Our priorities there are to maintain the regional science-based approach uh, so it's not broken apart into little um, bits and pieces. And then also to ensure that the new science that's uh, in the last 20 or so years being appropriately applied in the revision process. So the scientific synthesis that's been developed, so tracking that. And then we anticipate the big issues that are going to be uh, uh, needing to be addressed in the revision process are things like climate change. Climate change, believe it or not, back in the early 90s, um, even though it, it was well known and, and fairly well understood, it just wasn't as big of an issue. And so we need to incorporate what we've learned about climate change, and in particular, the world-class uh, carbon holding qualities of the forests of the Pacific Northwest. There's really no place else on Earth that is able to uh, absorb and hold carbon like we can in the Northwest in our large old growth trees. So that needs to be factored in. Another big issue that um, was part of it, but not as prominent, is the importance of maintaining habitat connectivity across the landscape for wildlife and considering in more detail, how are we gonna provide for wildlife movement across the landscapes, again, particularly as conditions change under wildlife and species are gonna to have to adjust um, to the, the, the changes in, uh, in the environment as a result of climate change. So uh, right now, the, there's not, it, it's not a priority to move forward with that revision, it's, it's, um, but, but, it, but we do anticipate that to change over the next uh, two or three years. I'll say the third thing that we're doing around that is we're initiating a lot of outreach effort into the communities around Northwest Forest Plan lands so that we get a better sense of what's the pressing concerns and issues from the people that live uh, and work around um, the federal lands. And that's going to help us uh, better engage um, and involve the public when the revision process gets underway. Thanks, Dave. Um, this one's for Kathleen. Uh, Dana asked about uh, work to restore Gold Creek near Soquami Pass and prevent it from dewatering in the summer, which harms bull trout, uh, kokanee salmon, amphibians, and wildlife. Uh, could you update on that effort? Sure. Um, so the Gold Creek Pond that's there now is, is artificial. It was created from a gravel pit, and the big restoration story there is to return it back to what it should be, which is a forested wetland. Um, that north-south linkage between the Cascades, you know, that's that high elevation passage that wildlife need, big and small species. And so creating this wetland as it should be will help with that. And as the questioner said, it will not dewater the creek. And so there's a NEPA process, just like with Snoquera. So um, it's gonna take a while, but that's important. We need to get public comment, inv involvement, engagement to do it right. And so um, the scoping period, uh, there was some, I think, pre-scoping education of people. Um, and kind of like what Dave was saying with the Northwest Forest Plan, get ahead and get out there, outreach education before the process starts. And then comments were um, solicited um, from the public uh, for scoping on the general ideas. They have, I think, three different hydrologically um, developed plans, uh, like plan A, B, and C that you can look at. 
and we provided comments on the importance of that restoration plan. Um, you know, some people are used to the way it is, and it's been that way since they, I guess, created uh, I-90. Um, so this is, you know, it's, it's, it's leading people down that path on, you know, why ecological restoration is important, why we, you know, we have a climate changed future in front of us. So it's good to get ahead of it now and do this work now while we, while we can. So um, some of this, you know, we're taking deliberate steps to bring people along and build a better outcome by getting those comments. So um, at, at uh, Conservation Northwest, we're working with a group of partners that um, I think it's the Kittitas Conservation Trust and others um, who are uh, at the forefront of it. And right now we're working on some educational signage um, that we're gonna put up about you know, what the vision is. So that's our first step. Um, I just went out there uh, with my son who's not in school about a week ago or two weeks ago. Um, so it's, it's gonna be neat to kind of see the before and after um, and, and um, for everyone to understand what that vision and importance is. So hopefully that answered the question. Thanks, Kathleen. Um, here's a, another good one. Uh, are there any specific fungal or insect infestations impacting our forest trees? Um, is climate change having an impact on that? Or is, and is, are there anything being done to um, um, mitigate that situation? Uh, so the, every year the state does uh, a uh, survey of conditions in the forest. And um, they look for things like bark beetles and tussock moths, you know, uh, uh, species that bore into the bowl of the tree and, can't, and might cause mortality or eat the foliage. And while there have been examples of beetle activity in Colorado and British Columbia and other places, uh, we've, we don't have anything like that. And where, the, where there are insect populations that periodically increase, uh, they, at least recently, they've tended to be fairly localized and, um, and, and not uh, on the order of, 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 uh, of causing people to feel concern uh, or uh, um, th that these are problematic. You know, from, from our point of view, Insects um, and diseases are ecological agents of change. Um, and when they are within the characteristic levels, uh, they are actually doing good work on the, by creating uh, dead trees that are important as habitat. And, uh, and so um, um, there, there have been examples, I think, of uh, um, Spruce beetles uh, really affecting old growth spruce up in the area uh, uh, northeast of Winthrop over a long period of time. Um, but there's not really, if I, I'm not aware of any specific management actions uh, or desires to, uh, to, to, um, to take an action against, uh, towards those. You know, Mike and Kathleen, you may have something you wanna add to that. Yeah, I'll just add that insect and disease, like you said, Dave, are endemic in our forests as part of the natural function and processes that go on. It's when they kind of go into the, uh, and we're well aware of epidemics, but the epidemic or outbreak levels where they really uh, can do a lot of harm. I'm not aware of any that have uh, gone to that level in the state right now in the Cascades. Uh, but like I say, the state monitors for that as far as the question of uh, impacts from climate change, a lot of the bark beetles, for instance, overwinter in the cambium of the tree, the uh, inner bark. <clears throat> and as uh, winters get a little less severe and harsh, uh, what we're finding is that the survival of those uh, larvae are actually um, better than we would expect. And so with fewer um, cold winter snaps or what have you, uh, we do see a little increase there in uh, survival, and that can make a big difference when you have a, an outbreak or an epidemic. So uh, some of the 
those effects you've seen <clears throat> and on the diseases, uh, most indigenous pathogens are, um, have natural agents or processes that can keep them in check. It's the uh, invasive ones that are really destructive like the white pine blister rust, for instance. <clears throat> and we know um, that the blister rust has moved higher in elevation um, and is really has threatened our white bark pine, for instance, in areas where in the past, because of uh, the cold in the winters, that hasn't been a disease that's been as relevant to the white bark pine. Thanks, Mike and Dave. Um, we all have time for just one more question. Gabrielle asks, if a person wanted to go about researching what currently degraded forests were like several hundred years ago, when they were pristine, are there any resources um, for that, like an like an online database? That's a great question. I mean, that's, um, it's sort of what everybody wants to have and wants to see because knowing what conditions were like in, in before, uh, climate, you know, climate change has been so dramatic and before intensive development, you know, and fire suppression from, for other reasons, uh, that's going to really help us understand, uh, better about what the baseline or reference stands look like. Right now, that data comes, as, as Mike said, from historic photos from the 30s. Um, there is also data from, uh, um, there's also data that comes from the time when they were doing the surveys to lay out the um, section lines and township ranges. Although there's a lot of issues with the results from those surveys. And then third, another way people get a good handle of it is stand reconstruction um, through um, tree ring analysis. And this is a, this is a more empirically based approach where you, you can go into an area and you core the ages of all the trees and then you look at the, at the, um, um, you look at the, the tree rings and you can kind of construct what the stand conditions were in the age classes. And there's a whole tree ring lab at the University of Arizona. And uh, there's a guy, James Johnston, who's done a bunch of research on this in the Blue Mountains of, of Northeast Oregon. Of course, each of these approaches have issues because as you can imagine, a disturbance that kills a tree isn't gonna show up with tree rings, right? And so there's, each, each of these approaches provides different types of information, but when you combine them together, um, you can really get a, 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 a glimpse at what your reference conditions uh, probably are and, and can kind of help point restoration actions in the right direction. Okay, thanks, Dave. Um, as we're wrapping up here, just one more thing. Uh, could you briefly talk work for the forests uh, of the Olympic Peninsula and how um, that connects to both our forest skill program and our Cascades to Olympic activity program. I, I, you, you warbled a little bit right in the beginning of that question. Could you repeat that again? Please? Yeah, sorry about that. Um, could you just briefly touch on our uh, work for the forest of the Olympic, Olympic Peninsula and how that connects both the forest skill program with our Cascades to Olympic program? Oh, great. Um, you know, it's been a while since we had an active program for forestry and restoration on the Olympic Peninsula. And our role there was years ago to set up a collaborative uh, to uh, help process thinking and actions on the Olympic Peninsula. The Olympic Peninsula was really, really heavily cut over for years. Believe it or not, they had a forest supervisor by the name of Ted Stubblefield for a very long time, and he lived up to his name. Um, as a result of that, and the fact that it's a peninsula, and so um, it limits the area that uh, what animals can move to recolonize or interact with the Olympic Peninsula, it was classified entirely as a reserve or as an area called an adaptive management area that you can learn and explore how to restore stand conditions. And so when we were engaged there actively, there'd been a lot of research that had been done about what do you do when you have an old clear cut that's been really densely planted with a single species, maybe even from a single genetic source, 
very, very densely. And that research showed um, that if you do a, if you restore some of the structural complexity to those previously harvested areas, they are going to develop older forest conditions faster than they would otherwise. So you're selecting for a lot of those planted trees to come out and for a lot of the natural regeneration, the cedars and the hemlock that might come in on their own and all the hardwoods to stay on site. And that has been um, pursued pretty assertively since that time. Um, using those restoration techniques in those plantations, as Catherine has said, combining that with road decommissioning while you're in there. Um, and that, that appears to be the, the course that the Olympic National Forest continues on. Great, thanks so much, Dave. Uh, well, we're just gonna go ahead and wrap that up now that we're right at six o'clock, right on time. Um, I just wanna thank everyone for joining us tonight for the talk and thank you to our panelists uh, for giving us a little glimpse into your, your work in the Forest Field Program. I just wanna acknowledge before we go that we have two other team members that weren't on the panel tonight that are also in the Field Forest Program, Tiana, who works out in the Colville National Forest and Laurel who works in the Central Cascades. Um, if you are interested in learning more about what we do at Conservation Northwest or more about our field forest program or support our restoration efforts, you can check out our website at conservationnw.org. Uh, just a reminder that this recording of the event will be available soon. We'll be sharing it. And we plan to host more events like this in the future, including a uh, membership Trivia night in September. Uh, so to stay up to date on those events, uh, be sure to follow us on social media channels and, or sign up for our monthly e-news on our website. And thank you again for joining us and I hope everyone has a lovely evening. Thank you. Thanks, Jen.